actually, I could just sit down because I think Charles has summarized the vision absolutely accurately. I had the privilege of getting to know Charles Chen uh, about two years before I finished my time here at the University of Cambridge. and was privileged that Charles asked me to then engage with something that was an idea in his mind. What made that idea special was both him as an individual and his personal commitment to what is a very important initiative. It was the vision that we couple something that is dear to the heart of Cambridge. We couple fundamental research in a particular domain with an influence into practice. But taking the parallels of medical education and medical research, we learn just as much by looking at practice and taking it back to study the theory behind it. In other words, this procedure and process is not linear, one leading to the other. There is a total circularity about it. So Charles's unique vision of saying this prize is not just about the individuals concerned. It's about how those individuals continue to influence for the better our capacity to deliver a better education for all. And that's, frankly, you couldn't say no to engaging in that. So thank you very much indeed, Charles, for that opportunity. And today's laureates beautifully exemplify uh, this uh, directionality and this circularity. I mean, Larry, I was just wowed by your uh, presentation today. Um, although I balked. I balked about your belief that maybe medicine's got the answers, because it doesn't. We're struggling. Is it worth investing an extra... 20 billion pounds, as our Prime Minister has said, into healthcare to keep me alive when I'm 91 to 92, probably with dementia by that time? Or is that money better invested in policy terms on somebody who's five years old and maybe living in a deprived environment? Who is going to deliver more to society over that time? But we are a caring society, and therefore we will try to do both, as do most societies around the world. What we have learned from medicine that might be of value to the, uh, in addition to all that you've said, is we've learned don't try to apply the gold standard of randomized control trials to everything. Sometimes good enough evidence is enough to change. And that driver for change is something that Charles said in his opening remarks that I've just made a note of two words. And that's actionable outcomes. Education and medicine suffer with the same problem. We deal with problems that, are take, that an observation today may take 20 years to get to an outcome. There is a fundamental issue here. Basic research in medicine takes 13 to 15 years, whether it's the UK, Germany, or the United States, proven by all of them, to actually change practice. In my current world, if you're a cancer patient with a life expectancy of 18 months, that's of no use to you at all, even though it might be to future generations. And maybe I will argue that for education, it's just as important it's the validation of outcomes from short-term changes to extrapolate and validate over a 20-year period such that action taken can enable change to happen during the experience of an individual child in whatever education system they are based on validity that's extrapolated and projected into the future. Now, my own daughter's a mathematician and statistician, so I know how difficult drawing these projections on small numbers and individualized data are. But I wish you every success as you embark on this, particularly as we individualize the information we get down to single um, rather than grouped data. And that's a huge challenge. So I think that your presentation was brilliant. And I just love the idea of setting standards based on 
objective data that you can begin to measure and to draw valid and real outcomes. The presentation by Anna is something that is extraordinary. Anna and I have had many discussions and I've loved the interactions uh, with you. Cambridge was not one of the institutions you saw on Anna's list. There was a particular concern in the early days of edX where there was an expectation for academic staff to provide the tutorial support for many of the programs. And I believe you're right, Anand, artificial intelligence will deal with most of that. But the problem in a research-based institution with a large number of staff is I'm not sure that the university would necessarily support somebody wanting to look after 20, 30,000 uh, people uh, at the end of the day. And this is the balance of an institution between research and, uh, and, and teaching. I'm not sure that is the correct decision. I do hope that you will continue to explore with Cambridge because I do believe everything that you've shown us today means that education will not uh, be released from the advance of technology. And this technology is broadly good and is broadening the accessibility of individual students to, uh, to achieve in the same way and will actually reduce the inequalities that we actually face. I just came back last week from Madhya Pradesh and had the opportunity to visit a couple of village schools. What was the most important thing I saw? They'd actually built a platform to be able to charge their iPads so that they can actually access information which is current, which is up to date, and supports the teachers in their programs. That's how far all of those uh, issues are advancing. And what you're doing with edX, I think, is little short of brilliant. It's actually enabling things to happen. And the more I see that moving into secondary education, the happier I'm going to be in the future as well. And I do hope uh, that Stephen, my successor, will take a very positive view uh, in how we can begin to help to support some of the programs that you've engaged with. But we also had a lot of fantastic discussions that relate to what is great education. And screaming out of all of it came quality and empathy to me that we need teachers who can engage, who both have the capacity to, uh, to educate, but have the empathy to work with whatever failings the individual student may have. And to embark on that Humboldtian journey where teacher and student seek to move towards new discovery and discover new uh, uh, ideas together. And that is a principle that I think really uh, does uh, shine through. But it comes with a warning. If society does not respect teachers, and I'm afraid increasingly we see a devaluation of teaching as a profession, then we are heading for trouble. You might come and see me and invest your private information to me about your health and hope that I'm going to be able to support and to improve that. Remember what investment we're making with teachers. We hand over our children with a view that they will be educated to become global, hopefully global, citizens of a country to actually to take on and to live their lives to their full potential. I can't think of anything that is more honourable as a profession than teaching that actually picks up that responsibility. And Anna, you've shown that actually with technology we don't need to be frightened of it but it extends what the teacher can do, be it in primary, secondary, or tertiary education. And then we moved on to the interesting question um, of behavioral insights. The one thing I've learned from medicine and behavioral insights, it is always the counterintuitive one that actually uh, works. How to change behavior is one of the, and change cultural approaches is one of the hardest things to do. And it's amazing how simple the questions are, are that you, you deal with. A small study done in Cambridge, which I did uh, shortly, when, if I ask you what's the major concern of students in Cambridge as they enter their third year? You might think it's teaching quality, as we saw on, uh, on, on that area. 
74% of students said it was their future employment. And so we don't involve employers in assessment at our peril. And I'm delighted that QS showed us today that it really is taking that on board. And this is in a university where 98% are in employment and they're achieving the second highest national level of income within six months of leaving uh, the university, yet it is still a fundamental problem. And when I visited the Northern Territories in Pakistan to actually look at how do you get kids into the state-run system, uh, which Pauline knows very well from the DFID work, local work of schools with employers is absolutely fundamental to improving rates of numeracy and literacy in those areas. So do not underestimate the impacts that employers will have. So are we heading towards success? I think given what the Yidan Prize can do and hope with the ambition that Charles Chen has had for the foundation, I think we're making a great start. But it's going to take all of us to proselytize and to push politicians and others that education forms the most important policy set of decisions that any government, any system is ever going to make. Failure to invest in education is something that is a national and international failure. But with it comes another warning from medicine. So something that I use as an aphori uh, uh, aphorism is measure what matters and don't worry too much about what is measured. Because what is often measured in systems are the easy measurements. And both of our two who are trying to set up these indices recognize the capacity to measure outcomes in teaching is the most <coughs> difficult thing of all. So everyone in this university will say we are in the university to teach, but actually what largely determines university rankings is research performance. However much we begin to gloss over it, you can begin to draw all of those institutions by whatever ranking, and it's actually what their scientific output is. Why? Because that's easy to measure. And that's why in this institution, and I do know my successor feels just as strongly about it, it's that capacity to deliver education to all that will matter. So adopting technologies, adopting better information, adopting better analysis of data that we've got, paying attention to what rankings are there, but not paying painful attention to the minutiae, but to the broad messages that they actually deliver to us, is important for individuals, teachers, institutions, and most of all, government. But go beyond government. It should matter to each and every single one of us who's a parent, grandparent, somebody who is a godparent, somebody who is somebody who knows somebody with children, because what we're talking about is not the past, but the future. So Charles, your investment in this area, can I continue to wish it and work with you to ensure its continued success? Because by highlighting great practice in research, great practice uh, in, de uh, in delivery, we are actually doing something very, very special. It's going to be a long journey, but the more prominence we can give it, the more we will keep it in the public eye. And if we keep it in the public eye, eventually our systems will make governments accountable. So thank you very much for what you have done. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Well, I think you've delivered a fantastic conference today. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And my apologies for the rather long-winded uh, summary. It might have even kept you from drinks, which, of course, I should be saying that's probably to the benefit of your health. Thank you very much. <laughs>